program this evening. Uh, it's a wonderful title, uh, World Politics and the Changing Energy Landscape. And no one has to be reminded about all the ways in which you might be interested in the energy landscape. And also, of course, world politics is always interesting when a critical element of power tends to be reshaped affecting the configuration of power and the policies of nations. So I think the title is an absolutely wonderful one. We're absolutely delighted that Professor Clad has agreed to address it for us. He's had one of the more interesting and diverse careers, of <laughs> course. Um, he uh, has a law degree from in New Zealand. Uh, he served in the New Zealand uh, diplomatic service uh, he, for a number of uh, years, was posted abroad on behalf of uh, New Zealand's uh, foreign ministry. Uh, he was a senior correspondent for the Far Eastern Economic Review for a long period of time, and he wrote a very interesting book about uh, uh, the uh, crony capitalism, essentially, in, uh, in Asia, uh, especially among, in Southeast Asia, I believe. And, uh, then he, uh, interestingly, um, devoted a, a period of time to Georgetown University. He served as a Luce Foundation Distinguished Professor of uh, South and Southeast Asian Affairs, uh, during which time he also uh, uh, had a position as a senior analyst, I believe, with Cambridge uh, Energy Research Associates. Uh, and then he worked for the United States government in, uh, at AID and uh, again in the overseas uh, investment, private investment corporation. And then as an assistant secretary of defense for Asian and Pacific affairs. Um, and uh, after that uh, time with the U.S. government, uh, he has returned in a way to a middle ground and now is a senior analyst at the uh, Center for Naval Analyses. And he also retains his, his connection with Cambridge Energy Associates. It's a uh, career that has uh, spanned the Middle East, Asia. It's dealt with a variety of political and security affairs, as well, of course, as focusing upon uh, energy questions and other economic uh, matters. And, uh, it's a tremendous range, it's a fascinating background, and I think we're very fortunate. So it's my great pleasure to present Professor James Clad. Dr. Byrne, you're pretty amazing. You did that from there, not from the notes. Um, that was impressive stuff. I learned things about myself I didn't know. Uh, my sister, whenever she's forced to listen to a recitation of my so-called career, I don't know if you remember, there was a, a film called My So-Called Career. Uh, she always says, the best way to describe what you've done in life is to think of it as 80 miles of bad road. She says, <laughs> <laughs> and she, she's very good at, um, you know, like siblings are, you know, they, they find the, you know, the exhaust shaft and the Death Star and they go, ah, I gotcha. And, and of course, she's quite right. It is a life, Dr. Byrne, with great respect, it's a life of little or no account. And I hope that will be of use to you and Mr. Dell and others tonight. Um, I've been very fortunate, very blessed to have served not one great country, but two. Um, Mr. Joe was saying, I don't hear any New Zealand there. And I said, if you give me any more wine, you will hear New Zealand very quickly. Uh, there was a moment when 
I took my wife down there, who's this glamorous Southeast Asian woman, and um, wondered why it took so long <laughs> to get there. It's very far away. And we were driving along in the Waikato area of uh, the North Island, and I was going on, you know, on and on, as husbands tend to do. And she finally went like this, and I said, what's the matter? She says, I have no idea what you've been saying for the last three hours. <laughs> so I'd slipped into the patois, so I'll avoid that tonight and try to stay on message, if I may. Um, you know, the thing about the energy community, I was sharing this with uh, Sam, Sam Dell a moment ago, is that it's the sort of place where, unlike think tanks, where I've had lengthy periods of uh, residence, um, unlike think tanks where you have a wonderful conversation, a great, you know, exchange of views, it can go on, you know Washington, for many, many hours at someone else's expense. Um, there's no conclusion often, right? Whereas I remember, um, and actually it was for your former company, sir, I remember once being dialed into a boardroom meeting thinking afterwards, this is the life for me, and I'll tell you why. Because they said, you know something about Indonesia, don't you? And I said, yeah, yeah, a bit. I said, well, um, Dan Jurgen, who's the man who runs Cambridge Energy, is a very good friend, said that we should pull you into our board, boardroom. So we have a question for you. So I was preparing, I was reading every conceivable thing about Indonesian prospectivity, you know, what they were doing, how sweet was the crude, you know, all of that. And so I get this voice, very sort of Texan voice, and says, are you there, Jim Bob? <laughs> well, yes, I am, absolutely. And he says, We've got a lot of B riding on an outcome, a lot of B, you know, my mind whirled as quickly as it could. I think he meant billions. And kind of, <laughs> Would you stick with Indonesia now, this was the late 1990s, or what about Saudi, which looks, which looks a little bit trickier? I said, you can't go wrong with Indonesia in the long term. And then I was about to crank up and give some tedious explanation of why I'd taken that decision. They said, that's fine, thanks very much, click. <laughs> and 10,000 bucks arrived <laughs> in the mail. I thought, this is great. How do I keep this job? <laughs> well, the call never came uh, again, at least not from that. I don't know why they paid me that much, honestly, but there it is. It's, it's, a, it's an industry where you, know, you more or less have to get it right. It's forgiving, isn't it, Sam, at times? You can make a couple of blunders, but, but the lines got to point towards success more often than failure, in fact, considerably more. And I always um, enjoyed working with it. And, and the reason why I got involved was I was uh, at, at Harvard, um, oddly, as the first New Zealand diplomat in residence there. Um, and I think the reason they took me was I was 29 and you know, they'd never had a New Zealander before. I think they had to look it up on the map. They weren't quite sure. And I was there for a year, and I met this man called Daniel Jurgen, whose first book was coming out. And it wasn't the prize, the one that became very famous and known throughout the country and the world that won him the Pulitzer, with the prize, the quest for oil and power. It was a book about the Cold War. And so we'd met and been friendly, and then Fast forward, I'm at Georgetown starving to death. For, you know, apologies to academic people here. <laughs> I was just going through a divorce and various things. I was complicated. And he said, would you like to work with me? And I said, sure. So we found ourselves out in Asia a lot. And I'll tell one more story and then try to get to the theme of tonight's talk before I wander off and digress upon a digression, which in turn is a digression upon a digression. So here's what. We did. We met the head of um, Unical. You may remember Roger Beach, too. He was out there, and they were going through something called the financial crisis in Asia. And the financial crisis, you may recall, in 1997, all the currencies were terribly overvalued, and they blew out in a matter of a week. And everybody had no idea where and how long the free fall would last. So um, before Dan Jurgen could stop me, they were wondering what to do, and I said, why don't you prepay your tax? <laughs> a stupid idea, really, you know, prepaying your tax. I said, prepay it. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, just write a check to the Royal Thai government and do an estimated tax. 
And so then all the public affairs people say, yeah, it's a great idea. We'll look like we're standing by Thailand. We'll run ads. We'll have TV spots. I said, no, no. No, what you do is you write the check, you seal it, put a stamp on it, and post it in the normal mail because the people who need to know what you've done will know and will appreciate it. And it was sort of, you know, like my first big score out there in advising from an area where I could advise because I spent 39, no, 29 years of my life outside the United States and most of it in Asia. And it was an industry that would be receptive to that type of thing. I really like the energy industry because, you know, it becomes very bureaucratic. They go through their review processes and all the rest of it. But one of my clients I advised to take Burma seriously, and I advised them that back in 2011. And, you know, if you let the lawyers run things for you, they say, too hard. We'll run into problem. If you let the public affairs run things for you, they'll say, reputational risk, terrible things are happening there, or it did happen, or in any event, we'll get stuck with a bad rap. But I was able to convince, you know, the CEO and others, no, let's do it, let's have a shot. And it's, it's, a, it's an enthralling industry with which to work. Most recently, my job was to do the defense policy for the United States in Asia for the um, administration of George W. Bush. Now there, that must require a slight addendum. Because when I went back to my sister, who also grew up in New Zealand, who's also a barrister, well, both of us have a funny picture of us with these absurd wigs on. <laughs> And we, I went there and I said, I have news for you. I have joined the, uh, the Bush administration. Well, you would have thought that I had, well, I won't say it. There are ladies present. You would have thought I had done something really unmentionable. There was a, a still moment that seemed interminable. I think it was broken literally by a coffee cup falling to the ground. <laughs> and my brother-in-law, who was Al Gore's chief of staff <laughs> and director of transition for the future but never to be Gore administration said, you what? <laughs> I said, I said, you know, I have a reputation in Asia and it's not about, you know, uh, I did a bit of a dance, but I regard my brother-in-law with whom I get on very well indeed as um, very, very accepting of that decision of mine. And uh, even now he finds it amazing because he has, as you can imagine, some very <laughs> fixed views about W, to put it mildly. Um, so uh, I went in and worked for one of the greatest um, public servants, I believe, the United States has ever produced, uh, Robert Gates. And Gates is just a phenomenal guy. If you ever, Dr. Byrne, have a chance to get him, you know, he's like available and he, you know, He's, well, he's more available than when he was defense secretary anyway. And um, he is uh, just first class, and he was wonderful. He knew that I'd been a New Zealand diplomat, and one of the 30 countries of which I had nominal responsibility was New Zealand. And I, you, I don't know, some of you may remember that way back in the 1980s, there was this issue which involved New Zealand denying access to American vessels on the assumption that they could be carrying nuclear weapons. Well. I'd been a diplomat for that country, which had taken a policy like that and had, you know, obviously led to a break in the defense alliance. No, no small thing. And so I kept saying, why are you letting me stay here? <laughs> why, why are you letting me do New Zealand and Australia? He said, oh, it's all right. And I learned that he'd hitchhiked through there as a young man. And he hitchhiked in Australia. And he had great, great affection for New Zealand. And when my friend Phil Goff, who was defense minister in New Zealand, lost a nephew, California resident nephew, who was in special forces. One of the uh, measures of character of Robert Gates is that he sat down and took what I'm pleased to say was a pretty good draft of mine, which was a letter of condolence, and took this letter and wrote, in a very small handwriting, wrote another length of the letter again at the, in the bottom. Right? It was very astonishing. So he was a, a person who could see that we were needing to do things that would lead, lead us to be able to get beyond the expeditionary wars into which we blundered in the last decade. And one of the things about Gates is that even in meetings in Singapore in the late 2000s, um, he was already seeing that this would be an area that we would be a player again in energy. 
um, because I guess of all the people who'd gone to Texas A&M when he'd been president and kept in touch with him. But it was, it was a great background to lead to the work that I'm trying to do now. And we now, finally, 10 minutes into it at least, <laughs> get to the point. <laughs> um, our country hasn't been doing phenomenally well, I would argue to you, for some considerable period of time. I'm talking about statecraft, I'm talking about blunders, I'm talking about missed opportunities, I'm talking about a failure to reinvest in. I mean, we, we read it, we know it, and it's a discouraging thing. I came back to America about 20 years ago after, and this is certainly a very personal opinion, of course, but after, I think, the best foreign policy presidency we'd had in a very, very long time, which was George Bush Elder, Bush 41, as he's known. And to watch that period after that, you know, you may feel my opinions are a bit harsh, but I felt that lots of opportunities were missed. When we were flush and we had good times, we'd squander our advantage, and then, you know, with great respect to the administration I served, it was ferociously on message, but it had also, the message was, you know, attacking a tactic. That's, that's what the war on terrorism was. Terrorism is a tactic, not, a, not an enemy. And so there was a lot of things which were very strange, and it's in that context, you know, because I was a war correspondent as well, some other things we can get into in question time, but seeing how the American advantage had been had been dissipated along the way. It's a very intriguing thing to see how, in a very rapid order, the um, existence of abundance, which is partially, not completely, enabled by the shale revolution, the shale extraction revolution, is altering our prospects and could be doing some very interesting things. I'm not a booster for it necessarily. If people say, isn't it going to lead to catastrophic series of earthquakes and you know, foul our water for a million years and all the rest of it, I'll say I'm not, and I'm not, an environmental scientist or engineer or a geologist. But I do see that the technology is changing very, very rapidly. Um, by the way, I'm fortunate to have with me tonight my friend Joel Swerdlow who lives in Washington, who does a lot of work on the whole question of ecology, of innovation, and has actually studied the emergence of all of the different trend lines that led, not so long ago, to hydraulic fracturing or fracking. And um, I hope that he'll have a chance to be introduced to you a little bit later on. Joel, where are you actually? Oh, way back there, waving his hand. So if there's a question that touches on the technology side of it and its evolution. I hope that you'll think that Joel's in the audience as well. A couple of facts that I find extremely interesting. Um, Texas now produces more oil and gas than a country called Iran. North Dakota produces more oil and gas than the two smallest members of OPEC. Qatar and um, say like Bahrain, yeah. The existence of abundance, while sometimes it's over over talked, is indisputable now. Uh, one of the things I've done, and I'd be very happy, Dr. Byrne, to send you a, so, some of the recent writings, and you can send them off to people, or you can delete them, whatever you want. But I've written things that uh, articles that that point out that the efficacy of the sanctions against Iran was enabled by hydraulic fracturing, in my opinion, because there was no way that you would have been able to apply sanctions against Iran in an environment where that extra supply wasn't available. Arguable, of course, because sanctions are a part of statecraft and, you know, lots of things can be achieved if you're really determined to do it. But there are a lot of things which uh, affect um, I think the fact checker is signaling that I've got this way wrong. <laughs> I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> got it? Right. Um, I was worried that it was my wife and I might have forgotten to do something. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so the, the existence of the, you know, broadly speaking, the shale revolution is something that you know, we're only beginning to deal with. Uh, I find a lot of the writing about it um, incomplete. I mean, for example, it seems to me to be inevitable, I'd be interested in your view, Mr. Dell, a bit later on, but it seems to me inevitable that we will be exporting LNG from this country 
fairly soon, a lot sooner than people think. Uh, we're seeing the permit process going on with the current administration. It's laborious, but it seems to be pointing in a certain way. Um, and yet, the consequence that's happening, I mean, you'll see articles in Harper's or The Atlantic or features in the New York Times about what fracking means in North Dakota, but it tends to be in the <clears throat> sort of the human interest variety, whereas the impetus for improved study at higher education level, engineering, that type of thing, seems to me to be indisputable. The money that's going out there, the change in the prospects uh, of these areas, which were being vacated over the last 40 or 50 years in middle America. I'm intrigued by that. I'm intrigued also by a comment that I had last week giving a talk in Los Angeles, um, um, where it was right there in Beverly Hills. I managed to navigate around the Maseratis, find the right place that I was speaking. Uh, <laughs> and we, we, we got down to it. And uh, the people there were very intrigued by this notion that America was enabling uh, a major change in our geopolitical prospects. And amongst the audience was the Chinese consul, the consul general. Uh, for China in Los Angeles. And he's a very Oxford-educated fellow. He and I both agreed how wonderful it was to have gone to St. Anthony's College at Oxford and all of that stuff. Talked about sharing the brandy bottle and all of that kind of thing, which we never did. And he, uh, he said, well, um, you, you will be selling soon. Um, you may have noticed that our air is unbreathable in Beijing. I said, yeah, I noticed. I was there recently, and I've, I'm sorry, but I never want to go back again. If that's a risk, it's the most appalling air pollution. He said, we must begin burning natural gas and really replacing coal. And so he was, his question was, will you deny us the right to buy from you? I mean, that was a very interesting thing. I, I think it's very crude to say, Korea and Japan, you're our friends, you're our treaty allies, we'll sell to you, you know, China, we won't. It reminds me of Paul Wolfwood saying we wouldn't give any reconstruction contracts in Iraq to the French or anybody else. You ask your ambassador friend about that particular bit of statecraft by Wolfwoods. Uh, <laughs> I think that it's pointing to something very, very significant. Gas is, seems to me to be on present prognostication to be plentiful. It seems to me we're going to be in play. All of the data suggests that import dependence, energy import dependence, of virtually every major area or country. Japan, of course, remains dependent forever. China, dependent. EU, dependent. But the United States and broadly North America, because by the way, our neighbor, Mexico, the changes in Pemex are profound. If they really get away from the system that they've enveloped themselves in, right, Sam? they will be able to tap into using North American skills, Canadian and American, because Canada is just as much a part of this if you insist on having flag labels on who owns this technology. This is very big and very different, and the Chinese want to buy. That's a big thing. One of the things that I find interesting also is that the technology is changing really rapidly. I mentioned this a bit earlier. Um, Dr. Swerdlow knows more about this than I do, but it seems to me that every time there's a kind of fixed certainty about how dirty the technology is, suddenly you're learning that people are using a type of very fine particulate matter in a closed cycle system to do the fracturing, recovering it, and not spoiling groundwater supplies, if that's the issue. It's driven, of course, by the need not to do something that's going to get in the way of their need to continue what they're doing politically, but also because efficiency is driving them to better and better use of technology. I want to get to questions, but I want to close on a couple of thoughts. My, as a, you know, 22 year old New Zealand diplomat on his first posting in Jakarta, I had to face down a table of about 10 people, all of whom were terrifyingly, you know, older than I was, you know, by a factor of three probably, in Indonesian. And we were talking about 
a project that they were very, very keen to have from New Zealand, which was a geothermal power station. It's the first town that was built in Southeast Asia, in West Java. And I think I learned at that time how, how so much that was political in this country went through the energy nexus. It was, you know, delivering people's demand for electricity has been a constant in your political environment, whether you're, you know, Soviet planners going back to the 1920s or TVA under the New Deal. The deliver of power, the delivery of power is, is profound, profoundly important as a political issue for all of these countries. Asia is now both growing enormously quickly and is needing to back away from coal. In our own country, can anyone remotely guess how many coal power stations are scheduled to be retired in about two years from now? So from now until the end of two years from now, how many? Yeah, 127. 27 gigawatts and growing. And you know, you'd like to think they're doing it because they want better air to breathe and they, they don't want a big carbon footprint and all the rest of it. They're driven because gas, natural gas in this country is less than a third of the cost of Europe, right? And even less expensive than in Asia. And those are things which confer on us a great advantage, in my view, and an advantage that will become more apparent in coming years as we perhaps use proximity to fuel both and to feedstock as well as a chance to reindustrialize our country. But that's another topic. I want to thank you for the chance to come here today and meet so many good people and very happy to take some questions. Well, we, uh, we certainly do thank you for a, a nice introduction. Uh, you didn't emphasize the world politics part of the presentation as much as you might, so I'm going to invite you to, Happy to, to expound on that. Yeah. But uh, uh, our good guest will call upon people, and he will repeat the questions. The questioner has asked why I didn't mention nuclear power and, um, and asks whether there's a future for nuclear power in world energy. And by the way, let's make this truly a seminar here. People who would like to speak to this question as well, don't be shy. Um, one of my very better friends uh, became the, one of the most senior executives in Fleur, uh, Fleur Corporation, which had a lot of interest in what they thought about six or seven years ago was another chance to get nuclear up and away. I'm seeing uh, Sam nod here because it's always the thing which is waiting for the right moment to come back into its own. Even now, um, uh, uh, the more serious of the people in the British environmental movement are arguing for nuclear again. The difficulty is that it seems to run into the problem of choice, which is at any particular juncture people feel they can choose. Um, and um, combined cycle gas turbines working to natural gas just seems to me to beat and to trump any proposal for nuclear. The only place nuclear is really going up is where? Who knows? Uh, China, actually. Russia, China. Russia and China. You're quite right. Yeah, China. Very good question from the lady here saying, how can we talk about any possible scenario with the scale of, <clears throat> excuse me, population growth being what it is and how on earth can we deal with that? Um, I didn't come planning to speak about this issue, but I must say privately, I very much agree with you. I'm astonished that you know, when I was a child, there was something called the population explosion. All the lines pointed to exactly where we are now. All the deeper, deeper thought said this is going to place tremendous strain on sort of, you know, civilized life essentially and everything else. So I tend to feel that, um, that there, uh, the, the optimistic demographers say there is a built-in break on all of this, which is we all become middle class and the, you know, what the French call en bourgeoisie, we all become middle class in our attitudes and therefore we'll have 2.1 kids in the natural you know, replacement cycle and that we'll all settle down. But you know, the difficulty is if you look at places characterized by high demographic rates, um, they seem to be heading through migratory pressure and all the rest of it to 
real trouble. Look at the people crossing the Mediterranean, and Europe simply doesn't want those people, and yet they're burdened accurately and correctly with a legacy that doesn't want them to turn away because of the horrors of the last century. Madam, I have no idea what the answer is to that. I'm hoping that there'll be some something other than some vast virus or epidemic that deals with it. The question was administration's attitude to export of natural gas and also, I believe, to the Keystone Pipeline project. Uh, uh, and what's my opinion? Will, will it go ahead? And arguably, you were also asking, what's the pace? I think the pace is being set now. Um, the Louisiana uh, export projects, what are there, three of them now, seem to have gone ahead. Um, I think Keystone will be approved. I think it's integral to the, you know, North America's infrastructure. And, and you know, to say that you think that it will happen and then also broadly I think it should happen doesn't mean that you're some troglodyte willing to kind of put some filthy polluting pipe in everybody's backyard. I think it, inherent in our nature of our democracy is the regulatory impulse and the sense of holding things up for revision and for thinking about doing things in a better way. I think that's what's happening now. But um, if you ask me, as you did, uh, and now you all know he did, <laughs> um, I think the Keystone will be built, I think it should be built, and I think we will be exporting natural gas in not many years from now. The, the question is, he, he mentioned his work in Africa where he maintains an office in Accra and uh, spoke about the possibility that as Africa develops, it may be able to um, make an end run around some of the grubbier and grimier elements of the Industrial Revolution. There's not a set piece, you know, process. I mean, after all, if you think about it, it's very 20th century to think about a process as being something in lockstep. It's kind of Marxist and, you know, positivist, this idea that we have to have the agricultural revolution, then we have the industrial revolution, then we have what? The information revolution. I mean, these are, these are tricks, uh, rhetorical tricks. I think that your question is, can there be grids? Uh, um, can there be perhaps an adroit use of solar energy, other things? And uh, in other words, an entirely new model. And um, I have to say to you, I don't think it's very easy to do because I think that the, the look at what the Chinese are doing with privately owned motor cars. Uh, there, it, there's no way to stop it. They're, they're putting out something like a million of them a day. Um, this will clog up the roads. Um, the questioner here about the population uh, issue has left the room, but that's very profoundly felt. And I just think that those choices which are held out to people as, as a statement choice about having shown that you've arrived at a certain place in life, I just don't see how you can get past that. And I think it depends on a, an attitude to, environment, uh, to consumption that uh, we've helped uh, sell around the world. So I'm a little bit pessimistic. Sir, over there. The question is, uh, does China have a choice beyond just fracking um, uh, or maintaining its uh, coal? I mean, if you look um, at the projected use of different fuel sources in China at 2020, everything goes up, everything. Nuke goes up, solar power goes up, wind power. I've been in Xinjiang, where the Chinese essentially occupy uh, a foreign country because the people in Xinjiang and western China are Turkic Uyghurs. And they've put up on top of mountains a forest of wind turbines. Um, nuclear, natural gas, or, you know, even oil in some place, bunker, rubbishy oil is burned, everything. Uh, and the answer is, is fracking an answer. Well, one view is that the areas of prospectivity and for hydraulic fracturing in China in the north and what used, you know, Manchuria, that kind of area, very, very water deficient. But some of the changes in technology suggest that it might not be so dependent on that. Certainly the Chinese are taking a huge interest in it. But any map that you see in the world saying, here's a big area of prospectivity, I can tell you is probably wrong because people are just beginning to get to it, aren't they, Sam? Yes. The question is, uh, the German choice, particularly after the Japanese um, tsunami and the nuclear accident there, the German choice uh, toward green energy, isn't this likely to backfire in a very big way, leading to abrupt 
uh, what, leading to real need to increase their intake of uh, gas, um, oil, and other um, other sources of energy. I think the answer is uh, yes. I mean, you talk to Germany. You know, the German industrialists I talked to, I met some guys from Siemens, the very big firm, who, you know, are moving operations, a lot of their operations, to North America, to the United States, because of the price of gas, by the way. It's a very, very big change. And they're saying, you know, the price of energy is now critical to Europe's ability to con remain competitive. Um, I mean, they've done amazing things, but I think I agree with you. I don't think that that policy is sustainable. The question is that... Europe does have a lot of natural gas um, extractable through hydraulic fracturing and other places as well, but they won't do it. The, the strength of the environmental movement is very high. And he says the only place in Europe that may do it is Britain. And I w wish I could show it on the screen. A, a friend of mine is a man called Lord Howell, David Howell. He was Minister of State until he was kicked out. He made the terrible mistake of saying that parts of um, North Yorkshire, which is the bleakest part of Britain that you can imagine. So he said, you know, there's not a lot that's happening there. We could probably do some fracturing here. <laughs> and of course, everything landed on him. You know, there were points of order in the House of Lords, the whole thing. Everyone went crazy. So no one wants to do anything. By the way, if you, any of you get the BBC, there's a very good documentary that just, you know, these days you can call anything up. Have a look at it because it goes through this whole issue of, all right, we don't like windmills. We don't like this. We don't like solar. We, what on earth are we going to be able to do to meet our energy needs? Now, this gentleman back here, and then you, sir. The question here, and I hope it was heard, is Russia's position in the, the world energy markets and what they may be looking at in the next 10 or 15 years, if I may so paraphrase it. Um, again, in government and working with Cambridge Energy, it's been very interesting watching the Russians um, deal with what is in effect, you know, the political economists call countries that export or make one thing monocultures, right? Ecuador is a banana monoculture, it used to be, of course it's not anymore. Or New Zealand is a monoculture of grass, you know, it converts things into protein and then exports them and all the rest of it. Um, but Russia is a monoculture of hydrocarbons. I mean, it's, a, it's an oil and gas place which is, attempted to use it to uh, its geopolitical advantage. Um, I think a, a lot of the, the real tensions that we're seeing in Kiev are driven by the fact that the Russians feel that if the Ukraine departs and falls into the broader EU orbit, there's nothing much left for them, right? And I think that they're, the, game, the stuff that's going on there is very, very rough. Um, the answer, I think, is that they've not diversified much as an economy uh, since the end of the Cold War, and I think they're stuck with the consequences. Plus, if you look at the way in which they run their industry, they're running it down. Um, you know, the, the man that they put into prison, I've forgotten his name, uh, famous, Konarovsky. yeah, Konarovsky, you know, he was making his money by going back to old Soviet fields and managing them much better. I mean, the Russians drilled almost as badly as the Iraqis did. They go down, you know, they, we have a quota, we'll drill, we'll drill, we'll drill. What? We're not getting as much as we got yesterday. Let's put some salt water into it or pump more water or pump more oil back in to bring it out. Um, so badly managed uh, oil and gas resources. I think the prospect's not encouraging, and I think they're, to use a cricket expression, they're, they're on a bad wicket. The question is, what does the uh, increased supply of oil and gas through hydraulic fracturing in the U.S. in particular mean for the primacy of the cartel OPEC? Right. Well, I think it means trouble. And I think it means big trouble. And I think you ought to have a look at today's Financial Times, which has got a really good article on that topic, saying this cartel is in trouble. And it goes back and looks at the things that countries like Saudis are doing in the last six months, which is putting off ambitious and very expensive uh, plans for um, exploration and development and production of some of their own resources. I think you're already beginning to see the signs of contraction. Uh, yes, and then this gentleman. Shall I paraphrase that? Uh, uh, 
A major rationale for American global power is the preservation of sea lanes of communication known in the Pentagon as SLOCs. Now you've learned a new word. Um, and the point that the questioner asked or, or centered on was the notion, not the notion, but the truth that um, the supply of energy out of the Middle East at the moment goes almost exclusively to Asia. It goes to China, it goes to India, it goes to increasingly to Southeast Asia, which was the major producer before, but the balance is changing. So the question is, why do we have, I think it's the fifth fleet, based in Bahrain, when uh, the beneficiaries of the maintenance of uh, security in those sea lanes is not, are not Americans? And I would offer you the following thoughts. I don't know if it's an answer. First, do we want to be encouraging the People's Liberation Navy to be regularly patrolling in those areas? Um, they've done it once. They had a hard time getting out there. It's not widely known, but they weren't able to, I mean, they got out there, but you know, keeping a number of ships moving and you know, supplied and all this is a big enterprise. So it wasn't all that impressive. But by the way, other navies have gone out to join an anti-piracy task force that we've had. We've wanted to have virtuous things like anti-piracy, safety at sea, and other exercises out there off the Horn of Africa and near uh, the Mondeb and all that as ways to bring in countries in a, in a net positive way. The Indians have been out there, Pakistanis, but I would disagree that there's no presence out there. The Japanese now have people in uh, Djibouti, uh, which is um, in the Red Sea, and I think it will happen uh, more and more. Uh, I think that the high point of our involvement out there is passing, but it's passing as much because of um, our financial circumstances and also, as you say, the reasons that we are out there so automatically may be, at least in part, being reduced because of the hydraulic fracturing, uh, the supply enabled by fracking. Yes, ma'am. The, the question is competitive environment between, are you saying people that just produce oil and people who just produce gas? But they, well, they might produce both. Yeah, they do produce but, both. But they have very different yeah. commodities. You know, there are a lot of people in this room who will know more. The question is, what are the relativities and what are the dynamics between the two resources? It's a no. Yeah. No. no, it's a really it's a really good question, and it relates to many, many things. I mean, it seems to me, you know, again, I'm a rank novice in this stuff, despite having you know played on the political side for a long time. It seems to me that the big grip of oil is in the transport business, right? As lubricant, as fuel, and all the rest of it. And, you know, we may be seeing the first real break in that grip ever since, you know, the kind of early part of the last century, or may not be, because it's been, been predicted before, the electrification of vehicles. A lot of people three or four years ago, you remember, Sam, we're talking about the hybridization of the light transport fleet. That is to say, if you could take a Prius and just make them bigger and they'd be the vans that go around the city all the time, that would have a huge effect. And it's true that if you could somehow reduce American oil, transport-related American oil consumption could be reduced by 3 or 4%, it would have a huge and immediate effect on prices. That's the argument. Um, but it somehow seems to elude us. And in the meantime, you've got huge numbers of middle-class aspirants and people coming into that uh, income level in China, in Korea, in you know Jakarta, for example, in India, and they what do they want? They want a car. The, the questioner is asking if I, for my comments on the agreement as we understand it with Iran. Um, and um, Dr. Byrne, I think I've just, I'm about to forfeit any chance that I'll be remembered happily here. Uh, as I, I, you see, I've just lived away a long time, so I don't have inside me this zeal to humiliate Iran forever. I don't. <laughs> um, I'll tell you a story, which is a nice way of deflecting the question. No, I'll, I'll deal with it. Um, when I was a foreign correspondent, I, I visited during the Iran-Iraq war um, on the, with my New Zealand passport, of course. And um, I uh, went to see the foreign minister, and they were having such a bad day that I expected him to, his name is Ali Akbar Valiati. 
I expected to shake his hand, but the next moment I disappeared into this bear hug and I was rubbing up against this revolutionary beard and wondered what on earth this was about. <laughs> next day, big picture on the Iran bugle or whatever it was, it says, foreign minister greets New Zealand friend. <laughs> So I've just given away the real reason that I think we should have this deal. No, it was, I, I, I think Iran, we, I think any great power, and we are the greatest of great powers, should no, have as many normal relations as possible to maximize its advantage. That's why I would like to see it. I think it's obviously fraught with danger. I think that these are people who do intend to have a nuclear weapon at some stage. But so did Brazil, and so did Argentina, and so did South Africa. And things happened. And by the way, that capacity is still there, more or less on the shelf, to be switched on again, too. So I think it's really worth giving a chance. By the way, if you're looking at the markets, futures markets, it's really interesting to try to see what smart traders are trying to make of this, because they can't quite bring this up to believe that it could be an opening. But I think it is, and I think that we're looking, I don't know what, I'm really looking forward to hearing from this man, uh, who's been, spent a great career in ExxonMobil. I think we might be looking at um, a very different price per barrel in a couple of years than we are now. Sir. The question is, why do not the Chinese and the Russians reach more accord on the um, exploitation of Russian, uh, it's primarily gas resources, um, and therefore that will help meet Chinese need? Well, one, the answer, here's, here's a, a blast of thoughts. I don't know if it constitutes an answer. First is, Chinese still think about dependency. They don't like being dependent on the Russians. They remember party to party stuff. They remember that big time. Remember, they fought a war. It's, it's hardly known in the West, but they fought a major multi division war in 1969 uh, during the Sino Soviet problem. Secondly, um, the Russians have also been very, very slow to conclude anything with the, with the uh, Japanese for using the same resources. This has been in play for 30, 40 years. Um, the third thing, it seems to me, and by the way, hydro, I didn't mention the Chinese, you know, in the, in the array of energy sources, the Chinese are, they're terrifyingly um, intent on damming up every river they can find. And one of the things I want to do early next year is go up into the plateau, the t east of the Tibetan plateau is in actually the province of Yunnan, I want to see some of these deep gorges because they fully intend to dam the Brahmaputra, the Mekong, and all the rest of it. And this is, should be of concern to people as well for all kinds of important ecological reasons. You, you know, Tunle Sap, which is the part of Cambodia, you know, where the lake actually rises and becomes three times as large as it is the rest of the year, that whole process is now beginning to falter. It's, it's, so it does matter what choices they make. Uh, maybe one choice would be that everybody doesn't need a motor car. Maybe another choice would be to imp have improved efficiencies in their productive capacity, but they're not doing it. Yes, sir? The gentleman has a very, a very good question um, and, and, and comment about energy efficiency and why is it that our attention to energy efficiency seems to be intermittent um, and wonders why there isn't more policy focus on that. Here, here again, you know, not an answer so much, it's just a set of reactions. The first is that um, achieving efficiencies is usually done at an enterprise level for reasons of spending less for energy or whatever, you know, you're, you're paying for. Uh, so that actually I would respectfully disagree with you that we're not, that we have in fact gone through periods when high cost energy is matched. You know, the correlations are very clear with approved efficiencies and productivities and using less energy per unit of production and that kind of thing. Um, the, 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 the notion that um, those gains will be squandered if we now have cheaper fuel, we do have cheaper fuel and people are still persisting with some of the productivity improvements they made. It's a complicated question. And, but, you know, it's, it's a bit like the question, you know, if you read about hunger in the world, they say, there's not enough food. Well, the truth is there really is a lot of food. It's just that 25% of it's wasted. Rats eat it, or it's spoiled, or it doesn't reach market, or it goes to fancy restaurants in Soho and gets tipped into the rubbish bin. 
rather than consumed. So, you know, it's, it's a sort of variant of that answer, which is um, productivity is something that uh, is an enterprise decision, but that overall there's a lot of improvement in productivity. I don't see any way past it. Um, the, the question is, in the Eastern Mediterranean, in an area that is, um, falls close to Cyprus, Syria, Lebanon, and Israel, is a field called Leviathan. And Leviathan is being, uh, has been, I think the company that knows most about it is a company called Noble. And they're doing some very interesting work there. Leviathan seems to hold out the possibility of, um, of real energy security for Israel. And if they can achieve a degree of, you know, Levantine collaboration, it could do a lot more than just Israel. Um, there are maritime uh, boundary differences, as you'd expect. And it's very, very interesting to follow those. In a quiet way, the American government in both administrations has tried to nudge the Israelis and the Lebanese toward a situation where that line can be distinct. And then the question is, where is it going to be piped to? And then suddenly, there's some interesting possibilities for Cyprus. And of course, Turkey would love to be able to get the eastern part of Cyprus, which is the Turkic Republic that nobody in the world recognizes except Turkey. They'd like to actually give them some economic rationale for being there. So as usual, there's a resource, and then there's a million ideas about how to use it. But the juridical basis of who owns it and how is it going to be exploited have yet to be worked out. Uh, yes, sir. Gentleman's question is very germane, and it relates to um, uh, Arctic prospectivity in oil and gas, offshore platforms, harsh and forbidding environment, and any way is it necessary, given the um, uh, apparent onset of more abundance through hydraulic fracturing of resources that lie in less frigid <laughs> latitudes? Did I? Make a mess of that? OK. Uh, <laughs> and the answer is, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's, it's, it's extraordinarily expensive to work up in those areas. Did, did you ever, anyone here ever work up there or visit up there? It's, it's very, very demanding. And you know, of course, it's every environmentalist's worst nightmare that not only sludge comes out, but it freezes right in front of you. So I've, I've gone up to those places. They're, um, they're very demanding. But then remember, if the terms are, are good enough, if the resource is big enough and compelling enough, if the technology can do it, if you've got an infrastructure that can pick it up and you're making a lot of money, then people will do it. Um, it seems that the Russians, you know, but again, remember I mentioned this juridical problem, who owns it, what, all the rest, that's not at all clear. People are dropping, well, what is it, titanium facsimiles of their flag down to the bottom of the, of the ocean and all of that infantile behavior which characterizes political you know interaction <laughs> again again i think i went through the checklist if it's there remember you've got amortized setup costs they're already there right the pipeline's already there that's no small thing right i mean one of the things holding back the full extra you know potential of hydraulic fracturing, which the environmentalists are happy about, is the lack of an infrastructure to really t accept it, take it. You know, most of what's being produced is moved how in this country? Do rail. people know? Rail. rail, exactly, rail. People don't know that. The question, a lot of really good questions, uh, is we have successively, over the years, been offered solutions to our energy needs, which seem to be, um, uh, very, very optimistic, but which again and again, as per nuclear or offshore drilling, seem to carry um, potential for real disaster. And so the question is, is this not the same fate awaiting hydraulic fracturing? Is this an opportunity to call on my friend Dr. Swerdlow? Dr. Swerdlow says that's a very tough one. <laughs> I'm so glad you invited him along, Dr. Fern. <laughs> I, you know, yeah. Come on. I'll, I'll try to no, use, you better use the mic. If you look on the web for ecology of innovation, this is the man. Do I have to talk about my New Zealand childhood? 
No, no, no. Spare them. <laughs> I think that's a good question. And certainly, um, nuclear and other um, technologies were overpromised. The things that held them back were not technological glitches, they were political, social, economic glitches. And I think there's no reason to think anything in any of these technologies is permanent. Uh, hydraulic fracturing is not permanent. There are a lot of moving pieces. And it's clear, uh, all the studies show on the technology of hydraulic fracturing, that if it's done right, if it's regulated strictly, it's not a problem and people can make profit. But those are big ifs. If it's done right and if it's regulated correctly, there's a lot of wiggle room in those ifs. So I think that's a good question. And if, if you look at the literature, then I'll give the mic back to you. If you look at the literature on energy transitions from people walking to getting on horses to burning wood to burning peat, the natural gas is happening right on schedule. And there's, there's increasingly, from, from burning wood to burning peat to burning coal to burning petroleum to burning natural gas, there's a steady trend in the last two, three hundred years of more efficient use of carbon. And natural gas, whatever the anomalies of the hydrofracking process, natural gas is right on schedule that history would indicate it's happening this way. It's a pattern that's been holding steady for about 300 years. Well, that's a really good question. Um, and comes from a particular perspective. Uh, I'll try to paraphrase it. There, there is a thought that, as in all technologies, and technologies that involve dislocation, and maybe pollution, whatever it is, that maybe the next happy hunting ground for fracking is going to be in third world countries, developing countries, where the technologies can gradually be refined and improved so that at a magical moment where they're far less toxic and dirty, they can then be used in Europe. And I think it's possible that it works out that way, but I don't think that anyone has a master plan. I just think that would be asking just too much of us. Uh, also, the, the other thing, too, to, to really notice is that, that the North American advantage in this technology is something like all advantages that won't last indefinitely. But it's a really big element in the export of our invisibles, like you know, services, intellectual property, and all the rest of it. And if you go to places, you know, Brazil, you go to China, you're finding people out of Houston, they're working with uh, local, often state-owned uh, energy companies to, you know, see what the prospects are for hydraulic fracturing in those countries and to see what prospectivity is. And most of what I've heard is that it's extremely high. I just learned last week that South Sumatra is very, very um, tempting. Um, the gentleman says, and I believe very convincingly, that frankly we're speaking about stop gaps, whatever it is, damming something, fracturing, uh, ordinary conventional natural gas drilling, oil, coal, whatever it is, there's only one constant in our world and that is solar energy. And why is it that we can't somehow reach that particular point? And then he said that there was some recent research in Singapore which points to perhaps uh, uh, another breakthrough potential. Did I capture that okay? Very good. Yeah. And the answer is, I personally very much hope we go in this way. Remember, I, I thought I was very clear that I felt that we don't burn coal, we burn natural gas. Not because that's ideal and will last forever and it's perfect. It's carbon, right? Carbon's carbon. But that it's better than just continuing to do what we're doing. Well, for an absolutely informative and, and enjoyable evening, we thank you. <laughs>